Well, let's say another prayer of the Holy Spirit, and I'd like to read a biblical passage, then we'll start our theology course. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now at the hour of death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, instruct the hearts of your faithful by light of the Holy Spirit. Grant that by the same Spirit may be truly wise, never joyous in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady Guadalupe. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. Saint Ignatius. Pray for us. Saint Ignatius. Pray for us. Okay, um, can stand for the Word of God. It's uh, from Romans, but it's good to have reverence for the Word of God, whether it be the Gospel or not. This is taken from Romans chapter eight, and if you do the liturgy, the hours. Uh, in the morning. Uh, this would be this first reading for the Liturgy of the Hours, which is very beautiful, which sets the tone for our course as well as what we celebrate today. For those who live according to the flesh are concerned with the things of the flesh. For those who live according to the spirit with the things of the spirit. The concern of the flesh is death, but the concern of the spirit is life and peace. For the concern of the flesh is hostility toward God. It does not submit to the law of God, nor can it. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the spirit. For only the spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to our mortal bodies. Also through the spirit that dwells in you. Consequently, brothers, you are not debtors to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, but if the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. But those who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption through which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If only we suffer with him so that we may be also glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are as nothing compared with the glory to be revealed for us. For creation awaits with eager expectation the revelation of the children of God. For creation was made subject to futility, not of its own accord, but because of the one who subjected it in hope that creation itself would be set free from slavery to corruption and share in the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that all creation is groaning in labor pains even until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we also groan within ourselves as we wait for the adoption, the redemption of the bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that sees for itself is not hope. For who hopes for what one sees? If we hope for what we do not see, we, we, we wait with endurance. In the same way, the Spirit, too, comes to the aid of our weakness. We do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself intercedes with inexpressible groans. The one who searches his hearts knows what is the intention of the Spirit, because it intercedes for the holy ones according to God's will. The word of the Lord.
Good morning. So we welcome all of you to our uh, mini course in theology. And when I was uh, thinking about organizing this, I felt like I was in an infinite ocean uh, in which there's so much that I didn't really know where to start. And uh, myself having a degree in literature, philosophy, and theology, I was thinking, how can I give lay people who have a real hunger for God uh, a mini course in theology? Uh, we who have received a degree in theology, we're studying four to five years. So uh, it's kind of a long haul, and it's a beautiful adventure for us to study uh, theology, but there's no reason why lay people cannot also study theology. And so I thank you very much for coming. And what a beautiful day to start because today we celebrate the birthday of the church. So I don't think there'd be a better day in the whole course of the liturgical year to celebrate rather than enter into this mini course of theology today in which the Holy Spirit descends upon Mary and the Apostles after nine days, nine days in prayer and fasting. So thank you for coming. And um, I really believe, even though this is kind of like a, a crash course in theology, I really believe we're going to uh, really learn a lot in a relatively short time. The thought that kept coming to me is to kind of whet your appetite. You know what that expression is? To whet your appetite is just give you a little taste of theology, and then after these, uh, these 10 classes, hopefully you'll be able to go deeper. And who knows, maybe we'll be able to have an extension of this. Uh, so I was thinking, um, where do we start? And my thought over the past couple of weeks, uh, I thought the best way to start is to give you some theological vocabulary. Okay? I think you'll, you'll agree that this is a good start. Um, the reason being is this. I'm going to tell you somewhat of a uh, kind of a funny story. Um, I was reading years ago, I was reading a a documentary, and it was on medicine, and it was a, an article that my older brother wrote in a medical journal. Uh, my brother is an orthopedic surgeon, a graduate from Dartmouth in Columbia, you know those type, right? Okay. And I was reading his journal, and I don't think I understood 25% of what I was reading. I have a BA in English literature, so I, I know some words, no? <laughs> now why is it if I studied four years, I studied English and literature and grammar and journalism and alliteration and poetry, why, why would it be that I can't understand this article of my older brother? You know the reason why? Because uh, he is using a language of medicine. And I'm not a nurse or a doctor or, or a physician's assistant. I'm not. I don't have that vocabulary. So I was just reading through that. Maybe some of you nurses would have been able to understand a lot of it. But very, very technical language. And I think after I read about half of it, I just put it down. It didn't, I didn't even finish the article, no? I don't, hopefully my brother wasn't offended, no? So we have to have, we have to have uh, language, language skills in the specific area. Um, if I were to use baseball language, a can of corn, no one probably knows what that is. That's a high pop that anyone can catch. Turn two, if you don't know baseball, you don't know what that is, it's getting a double play. Okay, a suicide squeeze, what's that? Someone's on third base and the batter squares to bunt, and if he doesn't bunt it, the guy running in is going to be dead meat, no? Um, so having, having played 
uh, college baseball. I know a little bit of a baseball language too. So I think that this, this concept of, of language is very important. So uh, I'd like to start off giving you a class on theological language. And we're going to have a, a break in about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have a break for refreshments, and then we'll come back for our second session. So these words, I'd like to go through these words so that as you go deeper into this topic of theology, you know what these words mean. Okay. Biology means bios logia. It means the study of life. Okay. That's not written on it. Okay. But it's just that you are. You, 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 you all probably studied biology, especially nursing. You probably never knew, well, I didn't know that. Bios logia. Biology is the study of life. You've heard the word philosophy. Philosophia is the study, uh, Sophia is Greek for wisdom. It's the study of wisdom. Okay. Now here's a good one for you. Cosmetology, the study of the face, huh? <laughs> I thought I'd throw that baby in, okay. Okay, we're going to be studying now theology. Theologia. Theos is Greek, and it means God. Logia means study. So theology is the study of God. And of all the disciplines you could undertake, that is the greatest of all disciplines. Now, let's, let's go back to our analogy. Doctors will study medicine. But now more than ever, medicine is specialized. It's specialized. My brother, orthopedic surgeon, okay, so he deals with surgery of the back. Okay, okay a podiatrist, that's someone who deals with the foot. A dermatologist is someone that deals with skin. A pediatrician is someone that deals especially with children, right? A urologist is someone that deals with problems with, often with prostate problems, okay? These are specific branches of medicine. So you might see, you might see if I can use an analogy, theology is like a tree. Okay, the tree has its trunk, and the tree grows, and it grows, and it blossoms, and it flourishes, and then you ever see those big oak trees on the East Coast, okay? And all these branches, you have, wow, you have maybe a hundred different branches, but it's, a, it's the same tree. Got my analogy? So theology is the, it's the trunk, okay? It's the trunk. Now the branches are all the different specific disciplines you have in theology. Like in medicine. As I mentioned, medicine is basically dealing with the human body. But you got different branches. You got surgery, you got the, those are weird, with the feet, with the neck, with the eyes, all the different, probably have a I'm not, hundred different branches of medicine today. Um, so I've, I've tried to write down a, a, about 30 different branches of, uh, of theology. Of theology. So theology is the study of God. So you can say in these courses we're, we're undertaking the study of the theology, the study of God. In my, uh, my experience as a priest giving many missions, most people I know, good people like you, 
you're very strong on piety. Piety means your, your morning prayer, your rosary, your novena, maybe your litany to the saints, your picture of Our Lady Guadalupe, your picture of Our Lady Perpetual Help, uh, you know, your statue of St. Joseph, which is, which is really good. But where were I think deficient, and I'm not saying this in a disparaging way, is the doctrinal part. So the piety direct, is directed more toward the heart. The doctrine is divided, divided to, the, to the head. So to have a, a, a well-formed person, we have to form our hearts. We have to do that. But also we have to form our intellect. Analogy I've given when I give Marian talks, you have to have the two Ds, devotion and doctrine. It's kind of like if you've ever gone to um, Olive Garden with a salad, you just have the salad without the condiments on it. Not very tasty, right? But man, that Olive Garden salad from Olive Garden is about the best I've ever tasted. Ever got, gotten it? <laughs> Isn't it good? So we're trying to form a theological olive garden here, okay? We started with devotion. I pray the rosary with you people. Now going from, we're going from the devotional part to the doctrinal part. That happened as a result of original sin. You can see the... <laughs> That's one of my talks, uh, Christian anthropology, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay, so, so systematic theology is a ordered, methodical presentation of theology. An ordered, methodical, logical presentation of theology. What I plan later on this afternoon, or after our coffee break, if I have time, if I have time, I would like to present to you a catechism. The catechism is very systematic. If we have catechists here, some people are catechists here, a well-ordered catechesis has to have four pillars. It's very systematic. Okay, so, I'm going to try to go through these numbers at a pretty good pace so that we can have a vocabulary. Okay, dogmatic theology is not opposed to catechism. Did you pick up that joke? Okay. I said dogmatic theology is not opposed to catechism, okay? Didn't pick up that pun, did you? <laughs> Okay, dogmatic theology is essentially the study of the articles of the creed. Okay, repeat. Dogmatic theology is basically dedicated, good American maybe be pointing them out and checking them off is the study of the creed. How many, how many of you went to Mass? Uh, have you gone to Mass already? Okay, what do you have after the homily? Okay, you have the creed. Okay, now, in the creed, you probably don't know, but there's a lot of creeds. For example, when we pray the rosary, we usually pray the shorter creed, it's called the Apostles' Creed. According to tradition, the apostles were given one article of faith that they went to preach, and they concentrate on one article more than the other, the 12 apostles. But then there's called, there's the Nicene Creed, from the Council of Nicaea. Can might be louder, okay. Can you hear me in the back? I think it's pretty, it's resound. Can you hear me pretty well? Yes. Okay, good. Do they need it to be pointed to? Because I can do it. Do they, does it help? Ask if it helps if I talk to it. 
Uh, why don't you do that, Mary? Yes. Yeah. It's like the priest uh, when the mass changed. Before the mass changed, he started off the mass and said, "There's something wrong with the mic." And they said, "And, and also with you, right?" <laughs> I thought you'd like that one, huh? <laughs> okay, so dog, dogmatic, okay, dogmatic theology deals with that which refers basically to the creed. You have the Apostles' Creed, you have the Nicene Creed, there's another creed that's called the Athanasian Creed, and there are others. Those are probably the most famous creeds. The Apostles' Creed that you pray, uh, before the rosary, the beginning of the rosary. Nicene Creed, you pray in Mass on Sunday, which is longer. The Athanasian Creed, St. Athanasius was an Eastern father of the church. We'll be talking a little bit about that. Now, uh, when, when you can be exposed to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, do all of you have the Catechism of the Catholic Church? Yes. Okay. Now, in, the, in this, this is, a, this is a, a spiritual masterpiece that if you want to get to know your theology, you have to know this. Otherwise, uh, our catechism, our theology, it will be incomplete if we don't, uh, not to say you're going to understand it perfectly, but all of you should eventually read this. When it came out, Okay, Spring, you probably remember what we did in all of our masses for a whole year. We made photocopies and we preached for a whole year on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Father Al Hall was here, Father Larry, myself. Remember that spring? Okay. We, we spent the whole year, the whole year, our homilies were based on explaining the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, the first part of the Catechism is on the dogma the dogmatic part. So it explains, what it explains, who's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the relationship between the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the incarnation, hypostatic union, okay? It especially spends a long, a long, dense period on the three persons of the Trinity. Because that's the most important mystery in our Catholic faith, is the Trinity. That's number one. And in theology, we'll be spending some time on the, on the Trinity, is the most profound, but also mysterious truth is the belief in the Trinity. Okay, dogmatic theology. Okay, following uh, is... Uh, the, the Bible. Now the Bible. Okay, but the Bible, which is the Word of God, I mean, I'll be spending a whole class on the Bible, the Word of God. All of you should have a Bible. Okay? You all have a Bible, right? And... The, the essence of theology is basically taken from the Bible. What is the catechism of the Catholic Church is going to be explaining the Bible to us. So the Bible. The Bible comes from Greek, Biblia, which means books. The Bible is a library of books. Okay? There's different literary genres. So to have a really integral, complete theology, we have to get to know the Bible, the Word of God, more and more each day. Okay, uh, the next is that of patristics. Have any of you heard the word patristics before? Probably not. It's prob that's why um, 
it's good that we have vocabulary. Now, we as priests, these words, for example, patristics, we spent a whole semester on that one word. <laughs> so that one word, we spent a whole, a whole three and a half months just in that one word. Okay, now what does patristic mean? Patristic means it's the fathers of the church. Spanish padre, okay? It's the fathers of the church. Now, if you okay, really want to have a deep theology, you know, Bible, catechism, but you have to read the fathers of the church. Now, what I'm presenting to you, you're not going to do it overnight. This is going to take a lifetime. Okay, let, let, let me whet your appetite a little bit of the fathers of the church. John Paul II says the church has two lungs. Two lungs. Okay, the two lungs. You have the Western church, then you have the Eastern church. But they're still part of the Catholic church. You have the Western fathers and the Eastern fathers. I will not have a whole hour to present on the patristic, but let me just spend a couple, a couple minutes, maybe a minute or two on the patristics. These are among the most eloquent writers in the history of the world. So let me give you, uh, you know, give me, I'm going to give you some of the names of the, patri the fathers of the church. Okay, number one. He was the teacher of St. Augustine. And he actually baptized St. Augustine. He, okay, in theology also, the most famous book written outside the Bible in theology is called Confessions of St. Augustine. Have you heard that? Okay, Confessions of St. Augustine is the most famous book outside the, outside the Bible. It's one of the first autobiographies ever written. Okay? In Confessions, you encounter three saints. You encounter St. Monica. You encounter St. Ambrose. And you encounter... Saint Augustine. Saint Ambrose was the Archbishop of what was for many years the biggest diocese in the world, and that's the city of Milan. Milan, if you know Italy, southern Italy, you've got Palermo, in the middle you've got Rome, in northern Italy you've got Turin, where John Bosco is from, and Milan, where we have Saint Ambrose and eventually Saint Charles Borromeo also. In the 16th century, would be one of the greatest archbishop cardinals in the world. And John Paul II, his name is Carol Wojtyla, which would be in Charles Borromeo's patron saint. Okay, Saint Ambrose, Saint Augustine who's living about the same time. This person is key to understanding theology, especially the Bible. His name is Saint Jerome. Saint Jerome is a very important uh, father of the church. Do you people know why you can read the Bible in Spanish, Italian, and English? Because of Saint Jerome. For we're not for Saint Jerome, you people would have to read the Bible in Greek and Aramaic. How's your Greek? <laughs> That's Greek to me, you're probably going to say. Yeah? You, you'd have to read the Bible in Greek and Aramaic because that, that was the original. So he translated the Bible from Greek and Aramaic into what is called the Vulgata. Okay? He translated it into Latin. And... Spanish, most of you speak, a lot of you speak Spanish and uh, French and Italian and Portuguese and Romanian 
Those are the five Latin languages. Okay? And then it was trailed into the Germanic languages, English and German. So we really owe a lot to St. Jerome. A lot. Very important father of the church. Okay, who were other Latin fathers of the church? Okay, St. Gregory the Great. He was actually a pope. He was a father of the church. I'll give you one more, then I'd like to mention some of the Eastern fathers of the church. Saint Bernard. It's not the dog, but the person, okay? Okay, Saint Bernard. Saint Bernard, who was the greatest man of the century. He's known as the mellifluous doctor. How's your English? You know what that word means? That's a really big college word, huh? Mellifluous doctor means honey mouth. I'm going to feed anyone who wrote more beautiful poetry uh, and hymns in honor of Mary than St. Bernard. All of you have probably heard of uh, Stella Maris, the star of the sea. That's St. Bernard. Okay so, there, okay, so there you have a list of some of the most prominent, okay, prominent Western or Latin fathers of the church. So what you might do sometime this week, after we finish our course, just go and Google in, okay, you know, writings of Ambrose, so Augustine, Bernard, Jerome, Gregory the Great, just to get to know these great figures, because this, this, is, the, this is the foundation of theology. The foundation is the, is the Bible, but then the, the fathers of the church. Later we'll talk about a doctor of the church, a little bit different. Okay? The role of saints, but a little bit different, fathers and doctors. For example, you have St. Therese Lachieux. She's not, a, she's not a father of the church. She couldn't be, can you? but she's a doctor of the church. Okay? okay, now the Eastern. Okay, St. Athanasius. There's a church in Long Beach, and now there's St. Athanasius, right? who fought against what was called the Arian heresy. That Jesus, they were saying Jesus was not God. Okay, then there's another Eastern doctor of the church, the most eloquent. And he was a Greek. His name, there's a church in Inglewood in honor of him. I've been there more than once giving missions. Have you ever heard of St. John Chrysostom? Man, you read his writings. He's like the, the, the Shakespeare. He's so eloquent. The uses of images and analogies. And, I don't know about you people. I love language. No? So eloquent. Do you know what Chrysostom means? Chrysostom means golden mouth. Another one would be St. Peter Chrysologus, which would be golden word. <laughs> St. Peter Chrysologus, golden word. Then you have three very good friends. And in honor of the Holy Spirit, they're honoring today, Probably the father of the church that wrote, wrote most eloquently and voluminously on the Holy Spirit. His name is Saint Basil the Great. Have you heard of him? Okay, so Saint Basil the Great. Okay. 
and two of Basil the Great's friends, Saint Gregory Nansiansen and Saint Gregory of Nyssa. Okay, those are the, okay, there you have patristics. And of all the writings of the patristics, they're so beautiful. If you'd ask me, Father, what should I read first? I would say to read Confessions of St. Augustine. Of all of the, the works, I mean, there's so much out there, but the Confessions of St. Augustine, I think, would be on the top of my list. If any of you subscribe to the great courses, uh, the intellectual courses in the country, Bill Cook is probably about the best commentator on the confessions I've ever, I've ever listened to. Bill Cook. Bill Cook. So patristics. So one last thing I'd like to say on patristics. Many of them were writing to clarify the dogma against the, the heresies of the time. And one of the heresies of the time was Arianism, which was a bishop. His name was Arius. He did not believe in the divinity of Christ. So Christ was a very good man. He was a great preacher but he was not God. Who are the modern Arians? Are the Jehovah Witnesses, okay? And the Mormons. Jesus was a good guy, but he wasn't God. So you see these heresies are gonna be reflected during the course of the Catholic. Often the heresy will repeat itself and just change the name. St. Augustine had to fight against what was called Donatism, Arianism and Manichaeism. Okay. What is Manichaeism? It's a dualistic philosophy that says the matter, matter is bad, the spirit is good. My founder who lived in the 19th century fought against Jansenism. Jansenism is Manichaeism rehashed. The United States, Puritanism. Puritanism came in, it's the same thing, but they changed the word. So what happens is these heresies, they'll, they'll repeat themselves and they'll, they'll change a little bit, but the essence is the same. Okay, so that's the, that would be patristics. You got that? Yes. So the Western Fathers and the Eastern Fathers. And those who, uh, do any of you do the Liturgy of the Hours? Somebody pray the Liturgy of the Hours? A few of those. Uh, often you're going to see the second reading, it, not always, but sometimes you're going to get one of the fathers of the church. Probably the most common is St. Augustine. One of the most prolific writers in the Catholic Church is St. Augustine. Okay, from there, um, the next would be that of eschatology. Okay, we, as seminarians, we spend a whole semester on eschatology. Eschatology. Now, how many, most of you have done the exercises with us, right? I think most of you. How many of you have done the exercise with us? Well, it's probably 90%. Okay, if you remember when I gave it a certain talk, I don't always do, but I'll actually throw this word out to you, maybe kind of, kind of show off a little bit, okay? <laughs> but eschatology is what you meditated upon in the third week after the sin of David. Eschaton, or eschatology is the study of the last things. 
that eschaton, the study of the last things. For me, the last thing, I am fascinated by that topic. I never get tired about talking about the last things because if we meditate upon them, we're going to get to heaven. What are the last things? The reality of death. I'm going to die one day. And then what follows is judgment. You have both the particular judgment and then the general judgment. Then the reality of hell. We die in the state of mortal sin. We, without repentance, we could lose our soul. And then the reality of heaven. That's why we're here. Now the Protestants would agree with us on those four topics, but we have a fifth, and that would be, of course, what's that? Purgatory. So purgatory. So purgatory. That's eschatology, the study of the last things. One day we're going to die, and we face judgment, and or. Depends on which arrow you hit in the elevator. You either go up or down, right? Okay. You want to make sure we hit the right arrow, right? Mm-hmm. You ever take an elevator? You want to make you, you hit the right arrow, okay? Death, judgment, heaven, hell, and purgatory. And I would have to add a baker's dozen in this uh, topic. And it's the reality of eternity. We really cannot separate ourselves from these very serious topics without adding to this the reality of eternity. Okay, what would be the heresy against eschatology would be the New Age movement, right? The whole idea of reincarnation. So you're going to see these these, uh, theological topics, there's almost always going to be some heresy that's going to contradict it. You may even go through, go through these ones. Or what, what do some of the liberals or the confused Catholics say, which is off the mark? For example, theology. The opposite of theology would be that of an atheist, right? Probably heard the atheist says, I'm an, a- I'm an atheist, thanks be to God, okay? Did you ever meet one of them? No. <laughs> I heard the story of a, of a man atheist who was talking with a 10-year-old child who knew his catechism pretty well, and the atheist was saying to the little boy, that God doesn't exist. That's just a figment of your imagination. God doesn't exist. This whole idea of theology, that's a lot of baloney. And all of a sudden, there was like a wind blowing back and forth, and there was, a, there was an oak tree, and an acorn came out of the oak tree, and the man looked up, and it hit him in the nose. <laughs> and he got a nosebleed, and he said to the little boy, ha ha, that proves that God doesn't exist, because if God existed, he wouldn't allow a, 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 an acorn to fall and hit me in the nose. And the little boy said, no, it proves that God does exist, because God did not put watermelons in, in trees. <laughs> Go to response, huh? <laughs> Acorn watermelon, huh? So death, judgment, heaven, hell, purgatory, and then we have the reality of eternity. Okay, then I, I'd like to just go through one more, then we can have a break. So we'll have a, like a, about a 10, minute, 10, 15 minute break. But let me just go through the seventh, or whatever number we're counting, no? Okay. The seventh is, okay, then the topic of God.
You know what would be an interesting study is uh, ask all of you to write a one-page term paper on who God is. I think we probably have about 400 different compositions. Hmm? We might have a few heretics here, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> That's why we're here. We're going kind to of weed out the heretics, okay? But uh, I'm saying that a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Tongue uh, hopefully all of us are right, but we just have a different, a different perspective of who God is. Hmm? Like if I'm going to ask you who Jesus is, I ask you who Jesus is, we could have... We could have a hundred different interpretations of Jesus' different Christological titles of Jesus. But it's the same. For example, you say he's the good shepherd, you say he's the bread of life. Who's right? You're both right. He's the good shepherd, but he's also the bread of life, right? You say he's the way, you say he's the truth, you say he's the life, okay? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So see God as... A diamond. Remember, uh, 12th grade, when you were in 12th grade, you studied refraction in physics. You studied that in California? Refraction, where you have like a diamond, and then the lights of the sun go through the diamond. And it's almost, almost like a rainbow that's coming out. You see the different colors, okay? That's what God is like. God is like a beautiful, beautiful rainbow. And the more that we meditate upon God, the more beautiful He is. So, um, Right now we're going to have a, we'll have a, a short break and then we'll hear, we'll hear the, uh, the bell in about 15 minutes we'll come back and, and follow up on our theological study of these words, okay? So glory be to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And the fathers. So at the door there's some coffee 